Good morning to everyone and welcome to History Matters and so does coffee. I almost just like picked up my notes like History Matters and so does coffee. And that really wasn't going to have the same impact. I don't know why. I think I need coffee. At any rate, um, we're going to be talking um, about banks, why people hate banks. People have hated banks for a very long time. Um, but before I plunge into that topic, I turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who is going to tell us the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody. Uh, hi, friends out there on Facebook. Um, we are excited to be here because we are one week away from our in-person version of History Matters, uh, which will work a little differently, obviously, but uh, well, maybe we'll get John to come on towards the end and make sure we, we are all clear on how this is going to work. But for this morning, business as usual, if you're new to us, we have a really fun chat. If you're joining us through Zoom, I think the Facebook people have their own chat going. But if you want to ask a question, it's got to go down there in the Q&A because uh, that's where I will be looking for them in about 30 minutes. Uh, and Joanne will talk and then I will field her some questions. And then if you have a little extra time at the end, you can stick around for the after party. All right, we're ready. Excellent. And I will add to that, um, if there is anyone here for the first time to please indicate in chat and be sure that you're chatting to everyone. Um, tell folks it's your first time here because you will get a warm welcome from the Three Matters community. We, this is the, our 154th episode, 154 straight episodes pretty much. Uh, so we're definitely a community at this point. <laughs> We've been meeting weekly for a long time. Um, but at any rate, let me plunge into our topic for today. Um, which clearly comes from or was inspired by um, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, which has gotten lots of news coverage. Um, and I guess last week, different topic, woke, um, but it was people talking about um, a bank, the bank failing because of woke investments. <laughs> That's what started me off last week. So I actually didn't realize till this moment, sort of sparked by the same thing, totally different purpose. Um, it made me think about, because now and increasingly, um, we're going to see people venting about the bank, about the people, particular people associated with the bank, about people who pull their money from the bank, about people who love it, or people who hate it. We're going to get a bank, seems we're already in the middle of it, we will get more undoubtedly um, of a bank discussion. And bank discussions, and I will say I'm, I'm talking about, as I always do, the United States today, but what I'm talking about today is obviously not just something that happens in the United States, but there's a lot of deep feeling <laughs> about banks, generally speaking, regardless of whether it's a, a particular bank, Silicon Valley Bank, um, or just banking in general. People have very strong feelings about it. They have certainly all the way back to the dawn of the Republic. Um, not surprisingly, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, what people thought about banks uh, in the under the Washington administration and and what that suggests about people's feelings uh, about banks. Um, and I'll I'll touch a little bit on uh, Andrew Jackson as well. Let's see bank haters um, and bank lovers. We're going to talk about a little bit about Alexander Hamilton. So definitely a bank supporter. But at any rate, um, banks seem to symbolize things to people. It's a little bit of what I'll be talking about today, above and beyond the actual fact of what they do. Right? The actual, what they do, do they do it well? Um, what's their history of doing it? Uh, there's a lot of emotion invested with banks. And in part, well, I listed here a number of reasons why that's the case. In part, sometimes for some people, it has to do with the, the kinds of people that they assume are, um, invested, uh, engaging in banking as a practice, and they imagine, you know, what they might have called in the 18th century, money men, stock jobbers, you know, all of these guys, money, 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 these aren't like firm agrarian people, they would have said in the 18th century, there's these guys, we don't know who they are, they're rich, they have their own kind of network, there's stuff happening behind the scenes, at banks, we don't know what they are. And sometimes our money is entangled and that's even worse. And secrecy, big money, um, and the idea that there's some kind of a network of rich people making rich people richer. All of this 
emotion, all of these assumptions swirl around banks. Uh, and I think to some degree always have. Um, I want to start with, as I suggested a moment ago, um, the first bank of the United States, because that's a moment that, of course, sparks a lot of emotion about banking generally. It also gives me an opportunity um, to read a favorite ridiculous thing um, that I had to hunt. I've used it a couple of times in my lecture course, and I, I somehow or other never referred to it by name. So I put in time <laughs> digging through my computer, and now I'm not going to live up to the, the buildup, but at any rate. Briefly, let's start with the, the Bank of the United States. More importantly, what people thought about it. Now, in the, the quick and dirty version of this is it was basically the third prong of Alexander Hamilton's three prong financial plan. Um, and it was, I'm sorry, the second prong. The third prong is the report on manufacturers and that doesn't go well. So the first prong is assumption of state debts. The second prong is Bank of the United States. Um, and he says, and I have his words here somewhere, he says that a national bank will be, quote, a political machine of the greatest importance to the state. And that's how he saw it as one reason why he liked it, right? He thought it would be great, a political machine. It can help the government deal with money and help the government move money. And it will be something that will help the functioning of the government, and it will get wealthy people to invest in one way or another into the government, or certainly to invest in the American experiment. So that would be a handy thing by the Hamiltonian account, too. Um, and also, uh, and this is, we're going to come to Thomas Jefferson momentarily on this front. Also, um, generally speaking, it rested on a broad interpretation of the constitution, meaning, um, and I'm sure all of you, those of you out there who are teachers know this and won't go into detail, but um, the necessary and proper clause of the constitution, which says that Congress can do whatever is necessary and proper, dot, 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 um, became the subject of a big debate. Um, and Hamilton and Jefferson are certainly on either side. And Hamilton's argument is necessary, proper, what does it mean? of things. That means that the government could do a lot of things as long as the things that it's doing, um, are, there's, they're not being done um, unconstitutionally in some way. Jefferson says necessary and proper mean, those are words with meanings, those are specific meanings, and we should not be offering that kind of broad interpretation of the constitution. So the bank debate becomes a constitution debate. And as we'll see, um, that's a big part of the bank hate in addition to the sort of cultural bank hate it also ends up having to do with states' rights to an extreme degree. Um, but at any rate, uh, you have the, the Hamilton team, Hamilton and the Federalists and those who agree with him, really supporting the idea of a bank, really promoting the bank, um, writing poetry <laughs> about the Bank of the United States. Whenever I talk about Federalists and Hamilton and the bank, and I want to express to my students particularly, but really anyone, the degree to which um, the, the Federalists were waxing euphoric about what it represented and why it's important and it's, it's an institution and it's like what they do in the old world and you could, we could make lists of why it's a great thing. Um, and part of this sort of happy, happy blustering about why we need a bank or why the bank is great <laughs> this is the writing of poetry. This is co comes from a newspaper. So, so I'll just say to people, people like the bank so much, they wrote an ode to the Bank of the United States. It's actually titled Bank of the United States. Um, and I'm going to read it um, just because it's ridiculous. Thousand leagues of ocean rolled between these tranquil states and Europe's troubled scene. Divided thus, sure nature's God designed this land the asylum of the freeborn mind. You can already hear America like, woohoo, new world. Here shall an independent empire, interesting choice of words, rise, concentrating from all climes the just and wise. By innate principles expand its name, nor owe to foreign politics its fame. On this idea, federal wisdom planned the nation's bank, that bulwark of the land. <laughs> I'm sorry, you just, you gotta 
I got to laugh. Not Angloa, Francois, or the sage Mynheer, or mine, mine, I, I don't know how to pronounce it, but it means Dutch, shall in our schemes of finance interfere. The states as one agree that this is right, though pygmy politicians rave and write. Okay, there's a great example of Bank of the United States poetry. <laughs> so part of what I'm talking about here, and I'll come back to this at the end, is a, a lot of the um, strong feelings and emotion that get tied up with not just bank and finance and wealthy people, but all of the things associated with that and everything else about banking. Um, there's a lot of feeling involved. Um, I went digging for some of my favorite um, Jefferson quotes about banking, um, and th there are any number of them. Um, he tends to make strings when he talks about them, strings of things he associates with banking. So for example, he complains in 1792 to George Washington about Hamilton and quote, the hundred clerks of his department, the thousand excisemen, customs house officers, loan officers, et cetera, et cetera, appointed by him at his nod spread over the union. And he goes on and on and on about the shuffling of millions forward and backwards and backwards and forwards, paper into money, money into paper, right? This is all the stuff that he thinks is really in one way or another corrupt and intriguing and why is the national government engaging with it? Um, James Madison, I discovered also strong feelings. So he never gets, like it's always Jefferson we quote on the bank. So Madison will get his two moments, two, two minutes here from 1795. He writes to a friend and said, it is really laughable to observe the moneyed interest certificate mongers and stock jar jobbers alarmed whenever the people speak out about abuses, how they pretend about abuses and the bank, how they pretend to raise the cry of the constitution being in danger and endeavor to make the honest patriot president their rallying point when in reality, if some of them could fill their coffers, the constitution, the president and the people might go headlong to perdition without a sigh. They only care about their money. They're claiming to be patriots. It's all about money. But the the quote here that I want to offer, and I want to give, um, I was looking for my copy of the book, which I couldn't find. Stephen Knott, uh, historian Stephen Knott, saw uh, that I said I was going to be talking about the Bank of the United States, and he very kindly sent me um, a Jefferson quote. <laughs> Stephen Knott is a friend. Uh, and that, uh, this was like, I'd have to look at my phone. It might have been like one o'clock in the morning. I mean, it was it was some ridiculous time where, you know, I was like, oh, this is great. Um, at any rate, I, it was not something that I was necessarily um, familiar with before. He kindly said, oh, we all had to you. It's like, no, not really. Um, I'll offer that in a minute. I do want to say that um, Stephen Knott uh, wrote a great book, Alexander Hamilton and the Persistence of Myth, about his image over time and how that's changed. So I'm going to plug that for him. Um, but here's the letter. Um, and it's from Thomas Jefferson. Um, and he is ends up talking about the, the bank, 1792, Bank of the United States. And apparently, um, in Virginia, they were talking, they didn't like the idea of a bank, they were talking about what to do. And um, the legislature and the governor of Virginia proposed creating a state bank a Virginia bank to oppose the federal bank. So this is Jefferson on this. I have reflected on Governor Lee's plan of opposing the federal bank by setting up a state one and find it not only inadequate, but objectionable highly and unworthy of the Virginia assembly. I think they should not adopt such a milk and water measure, which rather recognizes than prevents the planting among them a source of poison and corruption to sap their Catholicism, not meaning their religion, and to annihilate that power, which is now one, by dividing it into two, which shall counterbalance each other. So don't plant another bank. Don't now make two kinds of banks in Virginia. The assembly should reason thus. Uh, the power of erecting banks and corporations was not given to the general government. It remains with the state, and he initially wrote state legislature itself. For any person to recognize a foreign legislature, meaning the national government, in a case belonging to the state itself is an act of treason against, hang on, 
Oh, here we go. I come back. We're getting to the treason. It's, there's like a big chunk of text here. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do this. Here we go. Ruining the punchline. Um, blah, 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 blah. It remains within the state itself. The power of erecting banks and corporations are not given to the general government. It remains then with the state itself. For any person to recognize a foreign legislature in a case belonging to the state itself is an act of treason against the state and whosoever shall do so under color of the authority of a foreign legislature, whether by signing notes, issuing or passing them, acting as director, cashier, or in any other office relating to it, shall be adjudged guilty of high treason and suffer death accordingly. You heard that right. By the judgment of the state courts. This is the only opposition worthy of our state and the only kind which can be effectual. If North Carolina could be brought into a like measure, it would bring the general government to respect the counter rights of the states. So he's proposing foreign banks, if, if foreign banks try to get into the states and the national government doesn't have this right, the states not, should not simply put up another bank and make it a state bank. They should say anyone who tries, any foreign government, not the state government, that tries to put a bank in Virginia is basically guilty of treason and will be executed. Now, I don't think Jefferson had visions in his head of, of bankers being lined up and guillotined or some such thing. I do think that he thought that kind of policy would send a really clear message to the national government and whoever was in power that this was not acceptable, right? This is not like, he calls it um, other ideas, you know, a milk and water proposition. Nothing halfway will do here. This is what we think. This is how strongly we think banks are poison. Banks are corrupt. They enlarge the power of the national government over the state governments. We need to say that people in Virginia who engage with that bank in some way are guilty of treason. That's a remarkable statement. And, you know, uh, yesterday when Stephen not contacted me, he said, probably all that to you that Jefferson talked about executing bankers. <laughs> no, that, that wasn't on my radar screen. Somehow I missed that. Don't know how, because it's uh, 1792, which is a year that um, I focus on a lot. But at any rate, that's a that's emotion, right? And it has to do with the power of the national government. It has to do with bankers and stock jobbers. It has to do with how people imagine the United States as a nation, right? Jefferson, agrarian nation, bankers are not going to be his favorite people. But that simple fact and the emotion behind what he says strikes at, hits at the fact that that this idea that banks somehow are networked, untrustworthy, um, corrupt, only for rich people, that, that sort of lump of assumptions that I think always goes along with banks. Now, I won't go into great detail here, but I have to at least touch on, on the second Bank of the United States uh, and Andrew Jackson and why Andrew Jackson really did not like the second Bank of the United States. Um, so the second Bank of the United States had a 20 year charter. Um, it was due to expire, I believe in 1836. In 1832, Congress tried to recharter the bank and Jackson vetoed the bill to recharter it. And part of the reason he hated this bank and banking generally, but particularly a national bank also had to do with states' rights. That somehow a national bank is part of the national government inserting its national government hands, its greedy national government paws into the states without the power to do so. So not only is it invading in one way or another, but it's not even entitled to be invading. So states' rights was part of Jackson's hate. Um, he also thought that it put too much power in the hands of a few, a handful, or certainly a small number of private citizens. He wasn't a big fan of that. He rose to power, um, obviously, promising to be the president of the people, man of the people. Of course, he meant white men when he referred to people. So, you know, we think about him as democracy, Jacksonian democracy. Jacksonian democracy was for a very select group of people. And as soon as you give a certain 
kind of person increased rights, everyone around that person usually gets decreased rights, right? So you say, oh, white men, more rights. Suddenly it becomes more important to repress people who are not white men. And that's part of what happens surrounding Andrew Jackson. But regardless, not a big fan of the bank, vetoes the bill, says a bank is, quote, unauthorized by the constitution, subversive to the rights of states and dangerous to the liberties of the people. Again, pulling at this sort of larger idea. And when he is reelected, he says the government is no longer going to be depositing federal funds into the Bank of the United States, which that's part of what a national bank does. He says, nope, no more. We're going to be actually investing federal funds into state banks, which got the nickname Pet Banks, uh, as though Jackson and his allies picked their favorite state banks, Pet Banks, and gave them the money that they might have given to the Bank of the United States. Um, so again, that's partly constitutional. That's partly kind of social, um, having to do with the kind of nation the United States was going to be. Um, it's a number of different things. It's a reminder, first of all, that um, even if I come to you and as a teacher, I say, you know, broad construction, loose construction um, of what, what, whatever construction you want to talk about with the, uh, the Constitution, and you say, ah, yes, that's Hamilton, Jefferson, the bank. There are so many other angles and interpretations and um, concerns and some of them personal, some of them not political. It's important to remember the complexity of these things when you're thinking about something that seems as straightforward as banking the bank or the Bank of the United States. Now, um, the bank ultimately, it, it is not, does not get rechartered. Um, and it was not until, I've got the year here, I, I made um, like a record number of pages <laughs> because the because the, the poem takes up a lot of space, <laughs> um, which that is actually is what it looked like in the newspaper, if you want to see, that's, that's copied from the newspaper. Um, at any rate, um, I believe it's in 1913, I was correct in my thoughts, um, that there's the creation of the Federal Reserve System, uh, and that begins to serve in the place of some of what these national banks did. Um, and the Federal Reserve System, located in Washington, it's the governing, the Board of Governors, I'm sorry, of the Federal Reserve System in Washington. Um, it is run by seven members or governors who are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate. So unquestionably, federal, national, right? That, so that's the, the very sort of thing that would have made people like Andrew Jackson and Thomas Jefferson pull their hair out in one way or another. Okay, so what is the reason why I went into this? Well, I've partly done this simply to make the point that nothing is ever so uncomplicated as to say the bank is about states' rights. The bank is about the constitution. The debate over the bank is about a lot of things. And we need to think about that today, particularly as debate about Silicon Valley Bank, and then I don't know if other banks are going to get roped into this or what people are going to start saying about banks and should the government bail them out or not bail them out. We're going to see a lot of discussion of banks, banking. And I think it's important to know and to read about how these banks work, like, like the actual factual working, actual factual. Um, working of the bank. Like, what do they do? How do they do it? Like, like really the running of the bank and, you know, what Silicon Valley Bank did right or wrong factually, um, and to focus on the doings, the actual doings of these banks, rather than to get sucked into what is bound to be um, a raging debate about other things besides the actual factual um, events that happened, you know, like, it's a woke bank. Yeah, no. Okay. So that is not part of a discussion, a real discussion about the bank and how the bank either worked well or didn't work well. A woke bank is using um, a kind of propaganda word to um, 
I've called it here before, rage harvest, right? That's a different discussion. So I'm, I'm partly encouraging you to focus on the facts and understand, use this as an opportunity to understand um, banking and how it works and how it should work in a way that will be useful to you. And, and I feel like I say this um, many, many times, and I it's partly because oddly enough, I'm a historian who focuses on emotion in the past. And then I repeatedly here will say, don't get swept up by your emotions into what's going on today. Always pause and think about what you're being told, why it's being said, what that source might want you to feel, and what's actually going on behind the scenes before you begin the outrage. And in this case too, since we're going to see a lot of political and otherwise deployment uh, of ideas, facts, images, anything else about banking and what it represents and what it doesn't represent and big money. And I can't even imagine other than the woke investing ridiculousness. At any rate, um, I'm encouraging you uh, to think, to, to watch what's happening, to listen and read about what's happening. Use it as a moment to understand actually our banking system, which is complicated, right? I mean, it is, which is part of why people are suspicious of it. The other thing I want to point out, only because it's the sort of thing that um, eternally interests me, um, when you dig around online and you look to see what folks in various um, newspapers and magazines have said about this Silicon Valley bank uh, collapse, some of them are saying it's the first social media caused bank panic. Because what they say, and I'll be interested to see, you know, if this is true, how this is true, their argument is that the bank um, on the one hand had depositors, um, often younger firms in the tech sector, and they were trying to withdraw cash because they were having problems financially. And then on the other side, rising interest rates reduced the value of government bonds. So you had on both ends, a little bit of pulling and that the idea began to spread on social media that the bank was gonna fall, that you know, it, it basically, there was a bank panic. And the word panic gets at my larger point here, right? Panic meaning people immediately withdraw their funds. Oh no, the bank's gonna collapse. I shall now remove all of my money. And of course the, the folk on the top of the food chain, I will take away my $5 billion out of the Silicon Valley bank. It, there's a reason why it's called a panic. That's because that's what it's based on. Just panic that you won't have your money and you immediately withdraw it. And so in essence, there was a bank panic. Silicon Valley Bank collapsed in the bank panic. And what some are arguing, I think Forbes magazine said it. I think the Wall Street Journal suggested it. Um, it was a bank panic that was fueled for the first time in the, the world of bank panics by social media. I find that fascinating. I always find it fascinating about how technology is shaping things that don't seem as though they should be shaped by technology. And this is another one. I will also note, uh, apparently in that potentially social media induced panic, $42 billion were pulled from that bank uh, when people panicked, went and grabbed all their money from the bank. So anyway, um, watch the discussion, see what's happening, use it to inform yourself about how banking is actually working. Don't get sucked into what will be a politicized debate about banks and banking. Um, and stay tuned to watch um, ways in which people might talk about uh, how this bank panic or how this bank crisis is different from past ones because of the particular moment that we're in. That will mean that you're thinking like a historian, right? We, I know about bank panics in the past. Let me look about what's happening now and see what's what it adds up to, and then think about ways in which it's similar to or different from what's happened before. And what does that suggest about the here and now? Okay, um, I, had, I did not see, um, it may be because, uh, oh, there we go. I did not see the mug, mug, mug on the bottom and I was getting nervous. <laughs> um, anyone here, oops, anyone here who is um, new? Uh, every week for 154 weeks, um, pretty much. Uh, I bring a mug to the episode, which is thematically related to 
what I'm talking about. I do not have 154 mugs. So there have definitely been repeats. I don't know if I've used this one before, actually. I probably have. I can't imagine I haven't, but it'll be really obvious why I'm using it. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Ta da! Ta da! <laughs> when I wake up in the morning on, on Friday mornings, um, so I think of the topic very often on Thursdays. I wake up Friday morning and I'm like, okay, gotta go. And then at some point really early on in the morning, I'll think the mug, what mug? And I did that this morning. And then I was like, oh, this one, this one I got. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, hopefully after the mug swap next week, you'll have a fresh batch of mugs. Oh, okay. and let me say before everyone goes away, that very thing that you mentioned, the National Council for History Education is having its annual conference, begins next week, the end of next week. Um, and I will be doing a live in front of an audience at the conference session of History Matters that will be beamed out and I believe recorded. So it will not only take place there. Um, and I hope to see lots of folks from here, lots of other folks too. If you can make it, I would love to see you. And apparently um, there is going to be some kind of mug swap, which I am not involved in, but it would be so in character for us. So um, I will wait at, at the end, maybe Annie can explain what that, what the mug swap means, but I want to, I want to get your questions. Okay. So we have lots of good questions. Um, Carolee always just teases me and she teases folks and says, if they put something about Bruce Springsteen, the question that it will move it to the top, which is not true. Um, but I am moving Gloria's question to the top because I thought it was interesting and it, it's a stereotype that kids often ask about. Um, so Gloria, who's one of our longtime friends here in the community, she says, do you see a link between the hatred of banks and anti-Semitism? Because we've been seeing a rise of anti-Semitism, but throughout history, that's been a, a stereotype. It's been a, you know, um, so I, I thought that was a good question to start. That's with. a really good question. And although I wasn't talking about bankers and the idea of bankers over time, that's absolutely true. Is that if you see people referring to global bankers, that's they're talking about Jews, the, the Jews, you know, being seen as a network of people. They have a private network. They don't know what they're doing. They have their own rules. We can't trust those people. They, you know, they connect with each other across national lines. They're, they're all of these, you know, what do I want to call them? Libels, slurs that are cast at Jews. And banker, absolutely right, is is a big one. Uh, and it, it touches on a lot of the things that people claim to be afraid of when it comes to Jews. So yeah, this is actually related to what I was just saying, which is um, when you see people referring to, it's actually, Gloria, thank you. When you see people referring in a general way to bankers or banks and, and throwing a lot of venom in that direction, it would be worth thinking about whether or not, it has to do with anti-Semitism. There are, you know, a handful of, of tropes that are eternally used against Jews. And, you know, people, you will mention them, you know, like this, and people say, you're making that up, right? Like on social media, like global bankers, and you'll say, oh, anti-Semitism, and people say, oh, come on, like, you're making it up. It's like, no, actually, for several hundred years, at least, <laughs> people have been using that that metaphor. So thank you, Gloria. That's actually a really good question. Gloria, Gloria's always with us uh, and she's always adding good questions. Okay. Our other good friend, Dale asks, in the early Republic, did the Masons have connections to banks that worried the populace? Interesting. I don't know about the Masonic link with banks, although that's an excellent question. And that would, in a way, sort of, if people knew about that, right, would connect with the other kind of concerns about conspiracies and networks behind the scenes and also sort of ties into banking and Jews. I don't know. Um, I mean, my hunch, well, I don't know. I, I was going to say my hunch would be that people who were Masons certainly were involved in either national bank or banking generally. I mean, people who were Masons often, not all of them, but there were a good number of, you know, pretty, um, what do I want to call them, high society folk that were engaged in the Masons, George Washington, um, whether their actions related to that had something to do with the Masonic order, I don't know. I do know that being a Mason and the fact that it um, 
shape your loyalty to other Masons, that you should trust other Masons, that you should help other Masons. I have no idea if, if that ever had anything to do with business in the realm of banking, um, but it's a really interesting question for, for all of the reasons that I just said. Catherine said something in the chat about Masonic symbols on the on bills. Oh yeah, um, there are there are indeed actually some Masonic symbols on bills. Yeah. And, and I then we said there's some national treasure jokes in there somewhere. Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> someone's, someone's going to pull them out, but that yeah, that that feeds the, into that national, national treasure, treasure jokes. Theory. Yeah, for sure. All right. So we've got lots of good questions. Um, Ryan, our friend Ryan asks, are there any other times where cultural or political matters outside of standard banking may have played a large role in banking problems, real or perceived? So uh, were there things besides political problems that played a role in banking? No, asking where, were there cultural or political matters that, that were outside of the standard banking oh. that might have played a large role in some of the banking problems? Like were there well, I mean, social influences on those problems? So my short answer would be yes. And my longer answer would be, I can't, right now, I'm not coming into my head a specific example of one because the, I'm not, I think I'm not entirely getting my arms around the question. Um, but I, but are there things that happen that attack banks that sort of beyond the standard ways in which banks get attacked? The answer would be yes. Um, and that, you know, just generally speaking, because of all of the fear and paranoia um, of banks, bankers, networks of rich people, moneyed men, all of this stuff, um, there could be any number of things that weave their way into that and will seem unrelated to all of those things in an obvious way. And that those kinds of feelings, emotions, fears will be feeding into these other behaviors. So that, that's not, I don't have the yes in 1824, but I, I, I think that because of the emotion, uh, attached to money men and banks and banking, there are going to be a lot of things that contribute to problems with banks that you have to pause and look at and evaluate to, to realize, oh, this is being fed by this, which doesn't seem related. Like, I, you know, I would bet, I would not have thought and didn't until the end of my research this morning that um, social media had anything to do with the fall of SVB, right? I just was, I just, and if it, if if there were a way in which that was obvious, I would have thought I'd grab at it because I'm so interested in the way technology is shaping everything, particularly politics. But there's an example um, of some seemingly outer thing that potentially had an impact that isn't about traditional things, but, um, you know, what happens when you can connect everyone in a millisecond all over the world uh, and spread truth or a rumor that a bank is going to fall? All right. Uh, our friend Richie Houston asked, do you think the main problem politically and economically with the first two national banks was the fact that 80 percent of the stock control and profits were private? By contrast, the Federal Reserve policy making is under greater public control. And then he says, full disclosure, my cousin David Franklin Houston helped draft Fed and serve <laughs> as chair while Wilson's secretary of treasury. Richie, I had no idea. Wow. Um, I do think that there was the idea that there were money men investing in some way, buying bank stock. Um, that idea did indeed send panic into people in a sense you know, the modern Federal Reserve System is a national institution. The Bank of the United States was doing national business, but it didn't have all of the ways to get into the nation um, that the Federal Reserve does. So it was a national institution, but it was less so than the empowered, um, much bigger Federal Reserve System today. So whatever was going on back then, the blend of money men, stock jobbers, and the government in some way certainly would have panicked people. Money men and stock jobbers, I think, although they're, you know, lawyers are the other category of people that, like, you can find people saying hateful things about lawyers through the entire entirety of American history. Um, there's a pamphlet written in the 1790s, like, why I hate lawyers. A similar thing, um, but it, it has to do in part um, with who these people are and what they're doing. 
Yeah, I was just telling Richie in the chat, the Wilson Presidential Library, I guess it's Wilson's birthday this weekend. Oh. They have a separate Twitter account for one of his sheep. It's called Wooly Wilson. <laughs> And kids follow it and pay, well, teachers follow it with their kids and it's very charming. So I told Richie he should show up at the birthday party since he's family, you know, he needs to go. Uh, okay, Dave asks, uh, and Dave, I think you were in the hospital last week. So we hope you are feeling better. Uh, it says, do US citizens hate banks or bankers today or do they hate when they are bailed out by the FDIC? Uh, socialized failures, privatized gains. And then he's wondering, do Canadians hate their banks now or in the past? Do Europeans or Americans unique in their hatred of banks? Well, I can't speak with great authority about international view, cultural views of banks, because I just don't know. And that's not a lot of people. So maybe they can chime in, the, our friends. Yeah, I was going to say, in folks from other world. countries, beam right in. I know we've got people from a number of countries watching us um, and inform us for sure. I would be curious to know. So that I don't know. The first half of the question was, what before international We're asking do do u.s citizens hate banks and bankers today or they just hate the fact that they get bailed out oh i don't i don't think those things are disconnected i mean i think people don't really know what banks do they don't know how their money is or isn't protected i think the bailout component which suggests Again, the sort of network of rich people who are helping each other all the time and the banks are somehow behind it. And where is our money anyway? I think there's a there's a, a, a sort of pool of things that fit together into a general distrust of banks. Um, but I do think bailing out a bank, the government bailing out the bank raises all kinds of other issues, very different issues from state banks and national banks, but a similar question about what should be the role between the national government um, and banking, generally speaking. Yeah, earlier in the chat when you were talking, I said I keep playing that George Bailey scene when there's the run on the bank in my oh, head. Yeah. Wonderful life. Yeah. But that scene, you know, most people remember other parts of the movie, but that's the one when I was a kid that always stuck in my head. And I would always ask my mother, tell me again why that happened. Um, every Mary Poppins is a run on the bank yes, in Mary yes. Poppins, which I know because I've seen it 892 times. That's right. Ooh, I should write a lesson that uses those two scenes. Write that down, Carolee. Okay. <laughs> um, Ryan asked, uh, oh no, that's, a, that's an after party question, Ryan. Okay. Uh, Dale asked, is there a high profile instance in American history where the bank came to the rescue of a serious situation? Bank to the rescue. Oh my gosh. Um, Uh, I, I, not, I, this is another question that I don't have a specific answer to. The, the short answer I want to have is yes, because even if it was the bank finding ways to get money to something that needed money and was a crisis, we might, you know, if the if there's something is happening in the West uh, between Native Americans and American troops and the American troops need money and funding and support from the government and the bank somehow helps that, we might not see the bank going to the rescue. We might just see the bank as the government and the government's funding its army. But that might be, you know, the, the sort of thing where you could say, yeah, the bank comes to the rescue. It's more like, um, when does when does the government come to the rescue or not, which of course is the big bailout question generally. Should banks be bailed out? You know, if they're not, bad things could happen. What are the bad things? If they are, bad things could happen. <laughs> what are the bad things? Um, so really, it, fundamentally, there is just a big question here. And it's it was talked about throughout what I talked about with Jefferson and Hamilton and, and Jackson. Um, a lot of this has to do really supremely with what should the federal government be doing in relation not just to banks but to our money and money generally how how much control should the national government have over that yeah all right tim asks uh he says banks and banking rely on trust did hamilton have anything to say about trust in terms of banking mm -hmm. that's absolutely true um is that uh he at one point i'm not going to get the quote right at one point he says, and, and I, it's not, he doesn't put it this way. 
he says the appearance of things is really important because it will inspire trust. So regardless of what's happening, you know, in his mind, he's like, well, whenever the army appears in public, it has to look a certain way because it will inspire a certain kind of feeling. And so certainly he would have been one to understand that there needs to be trust in the institution and the people running it for a bank to operate. I mean, you know, think about the, the word credit. It, you know, I, at some point in the past, I wrote about that, that word, and the fact that credit refers to um, what a company or um, what a person, you know, the amount of money that they can be held good for. It also refers to their reputation. You know, what is your, your personal credit, meaning you and what you personally are worth. And the fact that the personal uh, and the financial are, are mixed in that way, that credit can mean both of those things, I think touches on this very fact, um, which is that, yeah, trust is deeply involved um, and you have to, I mean, it's actually part of, get really broad here, you know, democracy, generally speaking, is grounded on public opinion and what the public thinks of the government, which again, is a matter not just only of trust, but does have to do with how people feel about the government, what they're willing to let the government do or not do, how their fears might shape what they put in office or not. So this is the sort of question um, that I love to investigate, which is um, how can we how can we follow a trail of trust regarding any one issue and, and look at the trust people invest in it? Uh, and I chose that word deliberately uh, and how that changes. Um, that would be really interesting. That would be kind of a cultural paper. You would have to be looking at the, the tone and the wording of different things to kind of get at different feelings about banks and such. But I think that's a, it's a great connection. And I think that's, that's, one of the many things that empower banks. And Ellen had an interesting question. She asked, uh, is there an estimate of how much money people hide in safe deposit boxes, under mattresses, et cetera, because they don't trust the bank? I don't know. I've been thinking about that throughout the question period um, because I, you know, I've been thinking if you don't trust banks, then you put money, you know, the, the cliche, you put it under your mattress. I don't know. And I don't know if it's possible. I'm sure it's possible. To estimate that, I don't know how you would do it. Uh, so we're, we're involving finance and calculations, mathematical calculations, neither one of which are things that I'm deeply invested in. Um, but you know, it would be interesting to know because for sure there are going to be a lot of people who you know maybe they have bank accounts, but they also have a blob of money that they saved and put somewhere else in case who knows what happens, I've got the actual cash in my hands. That's in a way an understandable logic, right? That goes into fear of banks, paranoia about banks, bank failures, um, money disappearing, right? It gets back to faith, trust. I put my money in this bank and I'm trusting that it's there and that I'll get it back. And it, if I don't trust either one of those things, of course you're gonna have a bank panic, but that would really deteriorate, dissolve our entire financial system. Yeah. Uh, people were talking about how could you put billions under the mattress? Okay, maybe not billions. <laughs> what else <laughs> said, said First National Bank of Box Springs. <laughs> but it made me think there was a, an elderly woman when I taught in Richmond, um, one of my students was talking about a woman in their church passed away. And this was a woman who lived a very humble life. They didn't think she had very much money. She didn't have any relatives. And when she died, she left a will that said everything in her apartment would go to the church. And so the people in the church thought that they were just stuck cleaning out some old lady's apartment. They found, I think it was $3.2 million in her closet in coffee cans there were thousands of coffee cans full of cash. It was like her own personal tithing system all those years, but wow. she didn't trust banks. Wow. And they were shocked. All of a sudden, this little tiny Baptist church wow. in Richmond had this huge, it was really, yeah, it was, it was astounding. Um, wow. She had her whole life. She just kept socking it away. Yeah. So when people leave you things in their will, make sure you check very carefully. Don't just start pitching stuff. Um, Actually, the, the, what I was told when I was 
helping to clean up um, my parents' home when they moved to a smaller place was never give away books from other people without um, yeah. moving them around so that because people will use money as bookmarks all the time. Th yep. This was told to me from people who their job is to sweep through homes and take things. And they're like, don't give us books without looking at them. Yep. <laughs> You'd be yep. surprised what's in books. Yep. And people also hide jewelry in coffee cans thinking robbers won't look there. Right. Um, Okay, uh, Dave asked, please define stock jobbers, the phrase stock jobbers. Yeah, so they're, they're, if, you, if you look in, if you're casually looking through 18th century correspondence, um, you will see references to stock jobbers and land jobbers. And I think that means basically speculators, investors, um, jobber being the person who is making land or stock their business. Um, so I don't, I did not track down the origin or the official meaning in the Oxford English Dictionary of the word jobber, but that's the way it tends to be used in correspondence from the time period. I think Jefferson tends to refer to land jobbers and stock jobbers. It's a great phrase, isn't it? I mean, it just kind of zings of the 18th century. Yeah, and it might also be a good mug. <laughs> um Okay, Miranda has a good question. Hi, Miranda, is baby Charlie with us today watching? Um, how did the Great Depression shift opinions on banks, especially with the rise of celebrity bank robbers like John Dillinger, who were cheered for their actions rather than reviled by many? Well, right, that's actually a really good point is um, different way of thinking about banks, but if you don't trust them, if you don't really know you know, what's who's benefiting from them or not, then potentially the people who are attacking banks and taking money from banks, generally speaking, bank robbers, not jobbers, <laughs> they might appear to be heroic in some ways, not because they're thieves, but because they're taking things from the banks. Um, so that, and that's a really, that's another interesting um, way of thinking about banks culturally. Right. Um, because I, I the, what I was thinking in part when I came up with this topic was was this question, this larger question, which is um, how do people feel about banks? Because um, so much of what we're seeing now and will increasingly see is, is like venting of emotion based in partisan angst in one way or another. Um, and I and I've seen I can't um, read on the bottom of the screen. I try very hard not to look at what people are saying uh, in chat, but I have seen people saying things about way back. And yeah, I'm talking about the United States, which means I'm talking about a little chunk of time. But you can go back into the ancient world and see people who distrust bankers, banking, you know, and, and it's for some of the very same reasons, maybe not constitutional reasons, but certainly um, for some reasons having to do with networks of wealthy men doing things for each other and somehow, you know, robbing the people of things and not being invested in things that matter. You know, soulless bankers, soulless banks are all part of this. Um, blob is always the word that comes into my mind. This sort of cultural blob um, of, of feelings attached to banks. Mm. All right, here is the final question, but Joanne, I'm worried that it's a sneaky way to try and win bingo. So I saved it till the end. Okay. Tim, who frequently is the first person to win bingo every week, asks, are we at a point of contingency if the Fed is dictating a fair amount of economic policy in the vacuum created by congressional inactivity in terms of regulation, oversight, et cetera? Okay. I'm not going to use that word because it might. And for those of you who um, are new uh, or are not aware of the fact that um, folks play bingo uh, based on what I'm saying, because there are certain things I will reliably, certain words I will reliably say every week. And I, I could name them all. And we're now at the point where when I utter one of them or think about one of them, I think, well, someone just got bingo. Um, and, and this word is one of those words. Um, I do think that um, things that are associated with banking and finance have that kind of unsteadiness and unsureness built in, right? Because finance isn't just cogs and wheels. Finance is personal interaction and relationships. Finance is faith and trust. Finance is, you know, the, the world of finance 
is grounded in one way or another on the people who are making it up, supporting it, engaging in it. And, and it's that very fact, trust and faith is a reminder of the degree to which as much as it you would want to say that banking and finance are absolutely, there are rules and here's what happens and it happens this way and we can predict it. Nothing, well, I don't say nothing. There are some things that are gonna be that predictable, but the fact of the matter is things that appear to be networked and mechanized and grounded and predictable very, very often are not. And that has been one of the big lessons that we've been learning over the last seven, eight, nine years um, is that all sorts of things, and, and you might bundle them under the idea norms, but it's bigger than that. Things that we just took for granted were predictable and steady and sound and churned along at a certain path. Suddenly someone questions one, someone violates one, and there you go. Suddenly we're in a, on a different planet, right? Suddenly it's like, wait, wait, you could do that? And if you could do that, what does that mean? That's That's been like our state of affairs for years now, which makes it an interesting time for historians. Um, historian brain, my historian brain is always fascinated by that. And my um, Joanne Freeman American citizen brain tends to just generally stay on high alarm. <laughs> And also, I mixed it up. Tim is our link master. Tom is the bingo winner. So ah, okay. it's a fair question. So I apologize, Tim. I don't want to align, align your good name and reputation. Okay. Um, I'm still saving Ryan's question for the after party. So we only have one more. Even though it's 11, I think we can do it. Yes. Uh, Dale asks, thinking of the early republic, did the gentlemen of the time think positively of banks as they were land speculating, looking for credit, or were they still part of the tobacco note economy thinking? Okay, I, here's actually a chance. I should have done this before now. Here's a chance for me to plug a book that will be coming out soon by a former student of mine who wrote his dissertation on land mania in the late 18th century. People wildly investing in land and buying and selling and huge financial crises attached to it. Um, I don't have in front of me the name of his book. His, his name is Michael Blakeman, B-L-A-A, -A, I think it's C-K-M-A-N. Um, I will post, I will go on Twitter and mention the name of the book because I want to plug this for him. But this is the sort of thing that he's been really interested in, um, is this larger question about um, how things like this work and his he's been interested in this moment when there was all of this land being bought and sold as part of the political system right if a, if a state needs money well maybe they can sell some land that seemingly belongs to them and then get that money to do something else with and then once again you get the intertwining of government and money and people and investment and private citizens and banks and um it's a it's a in a sense it, it's sort of a necessary combination of things that adds up to the, the network that equals finance, but it's a, there is a, a good reason why people feel nervous and don't trust banks because they can't see the cogs and gears and they don't necessarily understand the cogs and gears. And so many things happen in private or secretly and in the absence of actual knowledge, you're going to, I do this all the time, right? If I don't know something that I will think of like, 800 different reasons why that thing might happen, um, which on the one hand is helpful because you're like, okay, maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. On the other hand, I now have 800 things <laughs> to worry about or <laughs> think about. I'm really good at that. Um, anyway, I, I will stop there. Um, I saw someone say he wasn't Washington a land speculator. Every Well, not everyone. A huge number of people were land speculators. Because there was land being bought and sold, it was a new country, the land was changing hands. People were um, calling out to people in Europe, come to the United States and invest, uh, buy land, invest in us. It was a huge, huge mania. It, it was a speculation mania. And I know that land mania is part of the title of Michael Blakeman's book. Yep, we've already got the link, of course. It's called Speculation Nation, um, Land Mania and the Revolutionary American Republic. Okay, Speculation Nation. Yeah. I, I, I'm totally biased since he's my former student, but um, he's great and he's a great writer and I highly recommend his book.
I've already put it in my- to I plugged two books today. You did, that we love that. Um, yeah. All right, we, we did it. We did it. We're just a couple minutes over. So let me explain um, what comes next. So um, we are now going to go to the after party. Uh, what that means is that we will no longer be recording what we're doing uh, so that we can be freer and easier and, and range far and wide in whatever it is we choose to talk about. Um, if you have, I always say beamed in, I don't know why that's the first thing into my head. If you have beamed in through the NCAT website, just stay right here. And within a moment, poof, we will be in the after party. If you are on Facebook, watching us on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to ncheteach.org slash conversations, ncheteach.org slash conversations, and then you will be part of the after party too. Um, I want to, in the minimal time we have left here, um, as ever, I want to thank you for engaging in the conversation of democracy asking all kinds of questions, having this be a forum where we can not only figure things out together, but um, figure out useful ways of looking at the craziness that is swirling around us uh, in the world, in the United States, and in the realm of politics, particularly. Um, that's invaluable to, to be able to use this kind of forum to help us create our own lens of how we understand what's going on. So thank you, as ever, for being here, um, thank you, Annie and John, uh, for making this possible and for all that you contribute to this. Um, everyone, I hope you have a wonderful week. N now, let me say that next week, um, there will be uh, something happening on Friday morning if you beam in here, but it will not be live because I will be on an airplane. <laughs> and I'll be presenting at the conference. <laughs> okay, so so um, I, I probably am gonna record something in advance that will be posted. Uh, on Friday morning, but the, the that week's live uh, event is going to be Saturday morning uh, at seven thirty Mountain Time, yeah. seven thirty a.m. Mountain Time. You know, I I am devoted to this. If it's seven thirty a.m., and I believe it, right? I believe it said that um, if you go to that same link, nche.teach.org/slash/conversations, that that will take you to this version of History Matters. John can totally interrupt me now if I said that wrong, but I think that's the case. Just do the normal thing you normally do, but do it whatever time zone is right for you at, at 7.30 mountain time. I'll be totally gunned for it and then I will collapse in the afternoon. <laughs> I will be drinking so much coffee. John, can we just have like a giant vat of coffee available? <laughs> so that People we can take their mugs and like... <laughs> Yep. Yeah. And like scoop it in like a punch bowl. That would be fun. Yes. We should go to the, we should, we should poof now. We're, 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 okay. we're waiting for John to do the recording and the yes. Facebook. And